Greetings, tubers! Ah, ha, 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 ha. We're back again, and this one is only a very, very, very quick one. As you can see, nothing fancy, no green screens tonight, no graphics. Takes too long to edit, and to be honest with you, I have had a particularly busy week, um, which is a good thing, as my grandfather always used to say, better to be looking at work than looking for it. But <clears throat> it's come to the end of the week now, it's Saturday night, I'm still in work tomorrow, which is Sunday. I don't know if this video is going to get put up tonight, tomorrow or Monday, but it'll be up there very soon. And it's not a video dealing with any specific aspect of Flat Earth or conspiracy or bloody mud floods or some idiot sat in a basement somewhere in Los Angeles chewing on a Bible and talking nonsense. This is about a, it's a response video. It's a response to a particular YouTuber who's been leaving comments, I think, on my last video, which I welcome. You know, I'm not complaining about the fact that they're leaving comments. It's just that I cannot believe the sheer level of idiocy that exists in the mind of what one would presume should be a functioning human being. They're obviously not functioning in the realms of reality. Um, I can't remember the... the the name so it'll it'll probably pop up somewhere during the video when I'm you know doing the post stuff but um, essentially um, we were having a comment about uh, about water um, the difference between flat and level and they came up with with this comment they said uh, water pushes against the dam it is level there and is at the same level at any point in that reservoir yep I think that's something you can all agree with um, and they also said whether that reservoir is a mile long or a 500 mile long said and then this was the best one the problem here is that the earth curvature formula cannot be applied on a large reservoir well what an absolute stack of tosh because the earth curvature equation can be applied to any part of the globe any surf any part of the surface of it of course it can it's a globe equation and being as we are on a globe then any point within that globe is relevant to that equation. Nonsense. Another one, right? They came up with this amazing, amazing question. How would a ball stay on a table if the earth was spinning? This is another classic flurfish question. Um, they just don't seem to be able to get their head around it because what they see is they, they observe things, you know, so they've got a table and they move the table with a ball on it and the ball flies off. Yeah, but of course it does, you know, of course it does because the table is no longer static relative to the surface of the earth. You see, firstly, earth gravity is acting on every single atom of every single molecule in and on the earth. So everything is traveling at the same speed relative to everything else due to the Earth's rotation. Now, to expect the ball to move independently due to that rotation is the same as expecting to be, you know, traveling along in a car and you're at a steady 70 miles per hour, you're holding a ball over the passenger seat. It is the same thing as expecting to release that ball and instead of the ball dropping straight down and hitting the passenger seat, it ends up in the back seat. You know, that ball is moving now relative, at a relative velocity, to the Earth's surface. But it's static. It is completely still relative to everything else within the vehicle, including the seat, the steering wheel, you, and that piece of fly shit on the dash. So if you release it, it is just going to drop relative to your perspective straight down. If somebody is outside the car looking at it, They'll see, they'll see it drop at a very shallow angle. It's the old, um, the, it's the old theory relativity um, uh, thought pattern. You know the uh, what the hell do they call them now? Thought experiment. You know where the guy standing on a platform and a train goes through the station. Somebody on board that train is holding a ball. They drop it as far as they're concerned from their perspective. The ball drops to the floor, bounces and comes back up to the hand. Yet the person on the platform sees that ball travel. Yet the same amount of time has passed, but the ball has traveled further in one plane than in another. It's all to do with light speed, relativity and all the rest of it. Let's not go into that here. Needless to say, if you are traveling on the surface of the planet if you're stood there you're not actually still you're traveling at a thousand miles an hour okay 
that ball that's on the table is traveling at a thousand miles an hour. So is the table underneath it traveling at a thousand miles an hour. It really is that simple. Therefore, they are not moving relative to each other. Move the table, the ball will move, right? It really is that simple. Um, secondly, in comparison to you know its size, the Earth isn't actually rotating that quickly. Um, it's about uh, 0 0.005 degrees a second, which is about 15 degrees per hour, which means that the Earth only makes one revolution every 24 hours. Now, get a circular table that rotates, put a ball on it, and you turn that table at 0 0.005 degrees a second, 15 degrees an hour, 360 degrees in 24 hours, the ball will not move on that table either. It's moving far too slowly to cause any kind of, um, is it centripetal or centrifugal force? <sighs> right. Why wouldn't airlines take advantage of the Earth's rotation? Now, airplanes cannot take advantage of the Earth's rotation because, and this really is just as simple as, uh, as the ball on the table problem, when an aeroplane is sat on the runway at an airport, it is already travelling at a thousand miles an hour relative to the rest of space. It's on the surface of the Earth. And if the surface of the Earth is moving at a thousand miles an hour, so is an aeroplane that is sat on it. Relative to each other, the plane and the ground are not moving. Okay? Now that means that when an aeroplane takes off, it does not matter which direction it flies in. You know, whether it's going east or whether it's going west, that aeroplane is traveling away from that point of departure at a speed relative to the point of departure, not at a speed relative to Earth's rotation. That is why an aeroplane cannot take advantage of the rotation of the Earth. And they mentioned also something about why not go over the poles. Why, why do they go over the poles? Why do they just... The reason flight paths... Um, are used over the poles is to avoid prevailing wind currents that are prevalent at the equator and north and south of the equator. Now these wind currents are caused by the Coriolis effect which itself is caused by a rotating globe. Simple as that. You cannot have a Coriolis effect on a flat earth. Get that into your thick as pig shit skulls, okay? Next. At what altitude are you then falling around the Earth's rotation and tagging along for the ride around the Sun? Now, gaining an Earth orbit involves shooting out of the Earth's atmosphere into the vacuum of space. Yes, space is a vacuum. There's no ether up there, people. There is no firmament. And in fact, all firmament means in, I think, Mr. I think it was translated from... Aramaic originally, all firmament means is um, unchanging. You know, that, that's all that means. It's got nothing to do with it being a bloody glass dome or some kind of magical force field put up there by NASA because uh, Neil Armstrong stole some biscuits from Buzz Aldrin and threatened to tell the aliens or, or whatever it was. So, right, I'm being very angry tonight. Do apologise, but uh, the, the sh shit like this gets me angry. Um, so before anybody says about the ISS being, you know, a NASA fake, it really is there, right? So the International Space Station, um, which you can see with the naked eye, by the way, there are apps that you can get on your mobile phone that will tell you when it's going overhead, and you can go and stand out in the garden, and you can hold your phone up, and it'll put a little cross where it's appeared, and then poof, there it'll come, and you'll be able to see it going overhead. And when it does go over the head, other than the moon, it will be the brightest thing in the night sky. So it's about 250 miles up in the air, okay? Um, it's orbiting the planet at around five miles a second, which means that it gets one orbit every 90 minutes or so. So it's traveling fast enough that it's constantly falling over the horizon. And being as the Earth is spherical, it never reaches a point on the ground. It's constantly falling round and round and round. Now, the higher you go, the less velocity you need. At 1,200 miles above the surface of the planet, uh, orbital, orbital velocity is about 4.96, so 0 0.04 miles less than the ISS needs. Geosynchronous satellites 
they are at a much more considerable distance away. You know, things like uh, the GPS network satellites, um, satellite TV network, they have to be over a specific point on the Earth's surface at all times. So geosynchronous, synchronized with the geography of the planet. They have um, an orbital height of about 35,000 miles and an orbital velocity of about two miles per second. Okay. Um, this was another classic question. Again, this is this is absolutely stable, stable fruit of the flat earthers. How does the moon always look exactly the same to us when it is rotating? I'm scared. The moon always looks exactly the same in the sky, from our perspective, because it is in what is known as a synchronous rotation. Okay, it always keeps the same face facing towards the planet. And the reason for this is that the moon rotates once on its axis, axis every 27 days. And it orbits the Earth once every 27 days. Now, this is a relatively common phenomenon between planets and their moons in our solar system, therefore probably throughout the galaxy. Okay, it really is that simple. There's, there's no other way of putting it. If you can't get your head around that flow of people, then it just makes a mockery of your entire argument of everything else. Okay, so to our final and classic flow of a question. How can we see the moon in the day? Answer those questions, smart guy. And where's the toilet? I think I've done a little poo. We can sometimes see the moon during the day because the Earth spins faster than the moon orbits it. So sometimes the moon will be on the daytime side, okay? In fact, it will be on the daytime side of the planet somewhere between once every 12 and 13 hours. In fact, it's really as simple as that sometimes the moon is on the daytime side of the planet again if you can't get your head around that i don't even understand what it is that you're trying to argue for or against or indeed whether you're able to think logically about anything whatsoever okay very very angry today very angry video yeah it's probably a good job i haven't got the green screen up otherwise i would have probably would have torn it down ah Anyway, it's time to get calm. You know, I'm usually quite a calm, laid-back person. My wife tells me I'm usually pretty laid-back, even if there's a crisis on. You know, I'm usually pretty good, pretty chilled. It's just that these flurfers, they, they take 500 years of mathematics and physics and study by some of the finest minds that have ever been a part of the human race. And just because these flurfers don't understand what can be a pretty complex field, they immediately surmise that it must be wrong. Are, are these, do these people have such a massively overinflated sense of their own intelligence that they think people like Galileo, Tycho Brahe, um, Isaac Newton, Stephen Hawking, Albert, Albert Einstein, do they think these people are somehow intellectually inferior to them when these people can't even grasp the very basis of planetary formation which tells us categorically that something the size of the earth could not possibly have formed into a disc i know that there are going to be people saying well it was jesus jesus did it and he put the dome of the firmament firmament and he is above the dome and we're below the dome and jesus it's like off oh, Jesus, my entire ass. See, angry again, angry. I'm going to go before my anger spreads down your little internet Wi-Fi connections and infests your brain and you all get very angry and we end up in some kind of post-apocalyptic society with globists on one side and flat earth that the earth is on the other and we're throwing... Well, they'll be throwing rocks. We'll, we'll de be developing some quite complex mechanical weapons, but um, that's besides the point. If you've managed to make it this far without thinking, 
my god this welshman's insane um please do consider subscribing if you're not already subscribed if you are thank you very much just give that little subscribe button down there a bit of a click hit the bell notification and you will be alerted the next time i have a hopefully less angry rant at some of the genuine tsunami of idiocy that's uh, that seems to be rolling over the planet Sometimes it's harder understanding the Flothers than it is understanding the advanced physics behind the mechanisms of the universe. Not that I claim to understand that to any great degree. I don't. I know just about enough physics to realise that I don't know a great deal about physics in comparison to other people. Anyway, thank you for watching. I will catch you next time. Au revoir. Yeah.